Well, here we are. Um, I'm going to record, but I'm not. Somebody remind me uh, to start recording. I want to say some things that I'm not going to necessarily record right now. Um, most of you probably know my brother's dealing with uh, stage four. Uh, pretty aggressive melanoma. I think the journey's been now at least two and a half years. And he did some serious, uh, you know, what you can do, Keytruda, I think it's called, it's like a targeted chemo. Uh, he did another pretty strong med, and uh, at one point it looked a bit promising. And then when he was done with that, uh, it had come back. So, uh, we're just keeping our eyes now on the Lord, and we need a we need a healing, a miracle. Uh, a, fr a friend of mine posted when I did a Facebook post for prayer. Uh, one of the friends posted about a serious stage four that was wonderfully healed. So it's not an issue of can God do it; it's always an issue of will He do it. And you know, you have all kinds of different theologies and different uh, systems when it comes to soliciting whatever we think we need. But we're not in a position to tell God ultimately what he has to do. Uh, one brother said a pretty amazing thing about God. He, th he thinks he's God. <laughs> <laughs> and he's pretty confident in his job description. He's been doing it for a long time. So, one of Tom's son-in-laws is a medical doctor, brilliant young man, number one in his class all the way through med school. And he's really sharp, with a compassionate heart. Uh, so I stay in touch with him a bit, you know. And he says, basically where it's at right now, it's, it's not months, it's, it's weeks, and it could be days. Wow. You know, when you get into hospice, uh, it, it's hard to find that time right? But he's, you know, uh, taking morphine for the breathing issues because it's in his lungs, and he takes some fentanyl patch for the issues of the spine. So he's not in pain. And Kitty and I went up yesterday, had a great time. I hopped up in the bed with him, kind of laid there. We, when, I, when we grew up, we shared a bedroom. The two of us were in the same bed, and every once in a while, he would he start breathing loud. And I would just tell him, stop breathing. <laughs> <laughs> My brother's got quite a sense of humor. Well, okay, how long? Till morning? <laughs> and uh, we were talking about that yesterday. Uh, most of the kids, Tom had nine children. One's in heaven, uh, which is another whole story. Uh, all of them married. Uh, he has 29 grandchildren. Uh, so if everybody's all assembled, which is more often than you would believe, it's 49 people, right? Wow. We're missing Anna, who that, so it would be 50, but 49 people, so it's quite a deal. Cindy's got this system of providing food for the entire family. It's quite a when they have birthday parties, it seems like there's about three or four grandkids at least have a birthday party at the same time. Uh, I wasn't planning on it. So I talked to Cindy when I'm driving to church this morning, and uh, we have, you know, you, it's like you face the unthinkable as you believe for the possible. You got to juggle both. You can't just dismiss, right, the one. So uh, the kids were almost hesitant to ask me to do the funeral, not thinking I would, you know, make it through. And I told Cindy this morning that that would be right at the very top of a privilege for my entire ministry. I'm going to do my brother. <coughs> I don't care if I cry through the whole thing. Uh, it's going to be large. We're looking at First Baptist as a possibility or because uh, 
the Portas have a very strong legacy throughout the entire Cambridge area, plus relatives and Cloquet, the first church Tom was at. Tom had a real serious drinking problem. And uh, towards the end there, I think he was pretty much drunk for about three months. Uh, he would just wake up and open up furnos. And uh, he wasn't in school, and then he said, I'm going to quit. So he went to the Memorial Hospital in Vermont, Michigan for a weekend to dry out. And he went into convulsions and really got scared. So he called me. He said, I would like to, uh, can I come and stay with you for a week? I, I need some help. So I said, sure. So he came to Cloquet, and at the time, this is how divine appointments work. At the time, we had a powerful Friday night meeting. House was packed. Worship was really good. People were getting delivered of demons and filled with the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit. It was just one of those good old-fashioned, late 70s, charismatic, outpouring services. So he came. He got delivered, I don't know how many. He got set free, baptized with the Holy Spirit. He never, looked, he never went back to Armont, Michigan. He became part of the church. Now, Cindy was my youth group. She was pure as the driven snow. And he's been there for about three months and says, you know, I think the Lord wants me to maybe... I said, what? Yeah, I think I'm going to start... Are you crazy? You're not touching... You're not touching Cindy, and uh, but the Lord prevailed, and, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, he came February '79, April of 1980. I married him, and it's a storybook marriage, okay. And so then nine children, and nine uh, spouses of those nine children, twenty-nine grandchildren. My, my father, my brother is shorter than I am, but I look up to him. He is the greatest example of a Christian father I have ever seen. And I, I totally know that's not because he's my brother. You, have, you would have to observe the dynamic of how he relates with his children, which I've observed for many years. Okay, the hugs, the kisses. Sit in the lap in Papa's lap, and I mean, and it's the same with the grandchildren. So, uh, and what's amazing to me, this is the grace of God. See, he was 11 when my dad died. When our dad died, Tom was 11. And so, as we grew up, I went off to college fairly soon. So he's home with my mother and my grandmother, pretty much. And uh, my mother, she didn't have a clue. How are you going to keep this young boy under? She felt, I think she felt sorry for him. I think she, she just went way overboard on the mercy end and the oh. discipline wasn't to be found. And anyway, he, he went on quite a journey. But here we are. And now you're facing what is really uh, a path, obviously, you don't want to face. But we will. So pray for the poor family. Pray still, please, for healing. We're asking Jesus to heal him. Um, yeah. I have this Zoom call. I'm going to now. Uh, I have a Zoom call with for the colleagues we've been doing since March of 2020. Michael Cotton, Clem Ferris, Steve Fado, Rich Gow, myself. It's been rich. We've been knit together pretty deeply. And we've started to do things together in terms of like the conference and uh, so forth. And at the end of December, I said, brothers, what are you hearing for 2023? What's the Lord? You know, and you got to be careful there because there's been so many crazy prophecies uh, where you almost get turned off to prophecies, you know, because so much of it never has been fulfilled. 
but nevertheless, you know, you, you want to hear the Lord. You want to try to be sensitive for the sake of helping the church. And I got pretty much just one word. It's going to be a year of interruption. And that's what I'm going to speak on today. <coughs> Example from scripture that's the mother of all examples, really. A year of interruption. And you always want confirmation, right? So I shared that the last Thursday of December at our Zoom call. The following Monday, the football player collapsed on the field and almost died. And the NFL was interrupted. The sports idol in America was interrupted. That was also the same week where Congress had a historic difficult time to get the next House Speaker. Fifteen ballots interrupted. And then February 8th, in a very humble place, called Asbury College, which has a historic history, 1970, 1950, and of course Francis Asbury himself was appointed by John Wesley to be the lead head of the Methodist Church for all of America. He never married. He traveled 600,000 miles on horseback. And uh, he was just an outstanding young man, had a passion for what places like Asbury call it. See, it's a time where the old wells are being reopened. Uh, the Philistines messed them all up, what the Philistines represent. Isaac didn't dig new wells, he reopened the old wells. And so there are old wells being reopened as I speak. Now, Asbury, since it broke out, just, I mean, totally spontaneous, Steve Fado, who's three and a half hours from Asbury, drove up on the Friday, less than 48 hours after it broke out. And he said, you know, it's not a bombastic, charismatic, kind of crazy meeting at all. It's very simple, pure, uh, innocent, led by you. Uh, and it's just precious. And what's amazing is, and this is where social media, in the hands of God, yeah. is pretty stunning. In less than a week, the, the nations are, the, every state in the nation had been represented. Countries have started to come. They didn't know what to do. The town was overwhelmed. The police finally put up signs uh, I forget the name of the town where Asbury is. Wilmore. Wilmore. Full. Full. And, and you hear these beautiful testimonies. Young, middle, old, who felt led by God to go. And, and the magnetic presence of God is stunning. That's what draws. To, to come into a room and be saturated shortly with peace that sweeps through your entire body. Uh, and the young people, uh, one gal just so beautifully articulated what she saw in terms of a, a young generation having to get their heads wrapped around COVID, shut down, isolated learning, loneliness. It's like a massive orphan spirit and they're flooding the father's house, okay? And 21 universities around the nation are beginning to have prayer meetings and worship times and crying out to God and seeking God. Uh, there are nations right now that are in massive evangelistic drawing in the nets. Philippines, uh, I forget the country in Africa. Something is up, okay? Uh, I think Jesus is coming sooner than maybe we have thought. And that's good. Wouldn't that be good? And don't you want to be ready? Don't you want to have a heart pointed towards him and pure and 
filled with the Spirit. Come, Lord, even so, come. Be a wise virgin. Get as much oil as you possibly can. Uh, that's all in the framework of, of the last days. Uh, then, the Jesus Revolution movie has now started to come out. Kitty and I saw it. It's, it's a very, very good movie. You will laugh, you will cry, and that's when we got saved. We got saved in that time frame, 1970. Uh, and so this is about Chuck Smith, Calvary Chapel, struggling church, going nowhere, and he pretty much, you know, his attitude towards hippies was, you know, cl get cleaned up and go get a job. He, he didn't relate at all. And anyway, his daughter ended up going, and if you watch the movie, and then I've also watched some actual live interviewing documentary, it's quite accurate. Uh, Lonnie Frisbee was the charismatic evangelist, quite anointed in signs and wonders and evangelism. He ends up with his own issues later in life, and it's a sad story, really. It's kind of like a Samson who had the power of God but didn't, allow the character to be formed the way it should have been. And it got him at the end. But that, you don't dismiss what happened. Michael Knapp, a good friend of mine, was saved, baptized in the Pacific Ocean by uh, either Chuck Smith or Lonnie. They would both be in the waters baptizing. Hundreds, thousands swept into the kingdom. Uh, there's a massive anointing for harvest. There's going to be a harvest in Baldwin. Yeah. And it's going to be primarily young people. Yeah. And I, I, I'm believing that this place will be packed with young people. Yeah. Hungry. Bolted. Yes. Uh, saved. Filled with the Spirit. Water baptized. Got a lake close by. Yeah. Prodigals are coming home. <laughs> Prodigals are going to come home. Prodigals who were dedicated as infants or young, six, three months old, whatever, to Christ, the Lord's going to call in those chips. They're coming home. What God begins, he ends and finishes. So we're in uh, really amazing days. Uh, so we want to we wanna just be sensitive to the Lord. We're going to Greensboro. We're going to have our next conference in Greensboro, June 8, 9, and 10. You're all invited particularly young people. I don't know. Fill the van with your young friends. Come on to Greensboro. Uh, our Arise sons and daughters. Next generation. That's what we're, that's what we're going for. And uh, so it's an amazing day. Boy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do this now. Uh, yeah. Father, bless you. Thank you. We ask for your favor and grace in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Go to with me to Matthew 1, verse 18. Matthew 1, verse 18. Uh, I must confess during my preaching ministry, there was a time when I was very much anti-Christmas <laughs> for a number of reasons, which I won't go into. Uh, So I wouldn't speak about the birth of Christ during Christmas. I would speak on the resurrection. I just ignored it. And, and it was for various reasons. And then the Lord got a hold of me and basically very simply said, there are four serious chapters in Matthew and Luke devoted to the birth of Christ. So you better pay attention and look at that again. Now I love it. It's, it's maybe the greatest story in the entire Bible. See, the Bible's a storybook. It's not an academic book. It's a storybook. So in Matthew 1, verse 18, here's what it says. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as <coughs> follows. And, and what I want you to see here is it's like a template. It's like um, a blueprint foundational pattern. The birth of Christ. And there's so much to be learned in the birth of Christ and all the characters and how God sovereignly wove together this incredible story. 
So the birth is as follows. So we're going to follow it, and we've got to follow it carefully. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Very simple statement. Now we've got to go back in our story six months. So you've got to go to Luke chapter 1. And you've got this elderly couple who are really uh, good people. They love God. The Bible has some wonderful things to say about their lives. They were righteous. They were devout. They were seekers. They prayed. They, they, whatever that system of kind of religion they were in, they were very, very much all in. But they were barren. Now the husband's a priest, Zacharias. And see, that priestly ministry is that faithful day in and day out ministry. It's beautiful in the sight of God. God loves to see our faithfulness. And I love the way it says in Luke 1, uh, here's this couple. Now, by the way, they have been praying probably for decades for a child. They weren't zeroed in on, oh Lord, it would be good if we could get the forerunner to the bridegroom. That wasn't on their prayer list. We just want a child. She was barren. Now it came about, all right, something's about to happen. See, in that faithful daily priestly ministry, that's wonderful and that's faithful. Now all of a sudden, bam, spontaneous, prophetic. And an angel shows up <clears throat> as he's doing his uh, priestly daily function. <clears throat> I got this tickle. Praise God. It's okay. Uh, I forgot to bring my body. That it doesn't. Oh, no Hallelujah. Zacharias is afraid. I think if an angel just suddenly showed up in your bedroom tonight, you might be a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough, statement. Yeah. Okay, so he's afraid. And the angel appeared, and Zacharias was troubled when he saw him, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. I love it. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you're taking notes, and I'm, Psalm 116 says, well, I love the Lord because he hears my cry. He hears my petition. You know, sometimes we think it's forever, right? Mm. Keep petitioning. And if you die and the last breath you take is a petition, amen. <laughs> Your petition has been heard. Your wife's going to bear a son. You will give him the name John. Now, Zacharias' life is being interrupted in a stunning way. Now, that name kind of, wow, and he... He manifests a degree of unbelief, so the angel said, okay, you won't talk until he's born. I'm going to put you on mute, because I don't want you to talk unbelief. I just want uh, to, I'm going to put you on mute. He comes out, and You'll be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place. The people were waiting. He's in there for quite a while, and he comes out unable to speak, and they realize, well, oh, he had a vision or something. And then Elizabeth became pregnant. She kept herself in seclusion for five months. Verse 25, Luke 1, this is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor 
Now that's a key word right there. That's grace. When God interrupts your life, he's going to bring grace to you to follow the path of the interruption. It's not like we're necessarily on a bad path. He's being a faithful priest. But his life's going to be totally altered. And so will Elizabeth. And so in the sixth month, uh, excuse me, uh, this is the way the Lord has dealt with me. No, when she's six months pregnant, Gabriel is now sent to this young, pure virgin. Her name is Mary. And she's, boy, a lot of estimate. For sure not older than 17, very likely 60. And she is engaged to Joseph. Now, that was a more binding engagement than what, you know, when people get engaged today. They actually would call each other husband and wife. You couldn't just break off the engagement. You actually had to go through uh, divorce proceedings. Uh, see, in a Jewish system of marriage, you had the betrothal, the engagement, right? And then you had this, usually about a year, where the bridegroom goes back home and the bride makes herself ready. And then all of a sudden the bridegroom's going to come and a lot of times he would come with an entourage if there was some welfare involved and there'd be a shout, behold the bridegroom. And the bride would get all excited and they have a second ceremony. That's where we're at, by the way. We're waiting for the second ceremony. Uh, when you got born again and saved, you were engaged, betrothed to Jesus Christ. Okay? And he's your lover. He's your best friend. He's your good shepherd. He's your elder brother who's really filled with grace. He's your everything. And he's coming for his bride. Wow. What a thing. Then we'll have a big wedding feast and, you know, the whole deal. Um, so Gabriel sent to Mary and coming in, he said... Hail, here, catch the word now, verse 28. Hail, favored one. She's kind of startled. She's kind of startled. The Lord is with you. Child of God, we need to come into a fresh revelation that the favor of God is on your life and the Lord is with you. Don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. Do you realize you found favor with God when you didn't even know you found favor with God? What do you think was at work leading you to that day when you got born again? Favor of God was in your life long before you actually got saved. Favor of God had to be on my life just to protect me from Instant death in some serious car, you know, filled with alcohol and crazy winter storm and should have been dead. Oh, good grief. Favor of God's on us. And that's good to know in these days. You will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son. You shall name him Jesus. You know what's amazing about this whole thing, by the way? The angels come in, announcements are being declared, prophetic things and locked in. God's been silent for 400 years. And now he begins to speak. And he will be great, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary, very innocently, verse 34, how can this be? How can this be? Well, here's how the birth of something takes place. And the birth of Christ was as follows. It has to come first with the word, and then it comes with the Holy Spirit taking that word and conceiving something in a heart, you can call it vision if you like, 
You can call it fresh hope. And God is coming. How can this be? How can I? And the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of God will overshadow you. And your offspring shall be called the Son of God. Now, you got to put yourself in Mary's kind of framework here. Surreal would be a, maybe a good word. <laughs> Far out. Uh, she has an encounter with an angel who says she will give birth to the Son of God. Wow would be an appropriate word to say maybe right now. How can this happen? Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. And the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Be sensitive when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He wants to put something in your heart of his word, of a fresh vision. He wants to interrupt your life. See, we can have things so planned out. And we got everything kind of, you know, like that priestly deal. And then the prophetic happens, bam. And now the word of the Lord comes. And your life is disrupted. You have to be open to that. I don't care how old you are. Uh, God, it's okay to interrupt this church. God, you want to interrupt what's going on in this community. Verse 36. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has conceived in her old age, and she who was barren is now in her sixth month. Verse 37, you gotta love it. For nothing will be impossible with God. That's why we're still in faith concerning my brother. Doesn't matter what you face. God's ability is greater than any disability. God's grace is greater than any sin grip. Mary can't go to Joseph. She's probably afraid. So what she does is she finds out about Elizabeth. You see how God's got this beautifully set up. And so, it, here's the word, it says, And Mary arose and went with haste. Mm -hmm. She left town in a hurry. And now you come to absolutely one of the most important aspects of this whole birth of Jesus, this whole incarnation. Mary is stunned, maybe on the, shocked, obviously surprised. Come on, church, please agree with me. She's not... Praying daily as she's seeking God, which very likely she was doing the best she could at the time. And she doesn't stumble on Isaiah 9. Oh, that's a pretty good promise. I think I'll grab a hold of that one. Why not give birth? <laughs> Why not be the virgin who is conceived that Isaiah talked about? No, she's not there at all. God just spontaneously comes. And we are in a season of, this is what destructions are, they're spontaneous. Uh, so if you're, you, we have to be willing to let go of our tendency of being maintenance orientated, just kind of minding the shop and be open to being spontaneous. Now, I'm not telling you to do anything crazy. Please hear me. But it does, it really is a time for us to present ourselves to the Lord and say, here I am, and if it be thy will, send me. I'm open. And it may be no further than across the street to your neighbor who is desperately in need of salvation. Um, I offer myself to you, Lord. So Mary knocks on Elizabeth's door. 
And here's what happens. And it came about when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. What do you, what's going on here? John the Baptist just began his ministry. <laughs> wow, there he is in the womb. Yeah. Probably gave Elizabeth a punch in the tummy. Maybe both arms went up. That's his ministry. Now here's what it says. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Wait a minute, God. Pentecost hasn't come yet. Well, you take that up with the Lord. I guess he can fill people with the Spirit whenever he wants to fill people with the Spirit. Amen. How crucial is it for Elizabeth to be filled with the Spirit to this very fragile 16-year-old girl? Elizabeth, if she's not filled with the Spirit, and filled instead with elder brother kind of jealousy, could have crushed her. She can't go to Joseph yet. She loves him too much. She probably doesn't even believe he could handle what she's got to tell him eventually. So she goes to Elizabeth. You see how crucial and important Elizabeth is in the process of giving birth to the Son of God. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. She's not jealous. She's absolutely excited. And here's what she says. And because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Here's what, here's what Elizabeth says. Blessed among women are you. See, Mary's in haste going to Elizabeth's house, and she's maybe saying, man, am I hallucinating? Am I making this up? Did something happen that was it what I ate for supper and I went, tripped out? She's in this precarious place. And here's what Elizabeth says out of the mouth of a filled heart. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. How has it happened to me? that the mother of my Lord. You see what Elizabeth just did? She confirmed the message of the angel spoken to Mary, maybe less than a day ago. How is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? I love that Elizabeth needed to get saved Mary will need to get saved. She's not an immaculate conception at all. She's pure, but she's not immaculate. For when you came in, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what has been spoken to her by the Lord. Wow. What a confirmation. What an encouragement. Mary, you're bang on. People sometimes get filled with a fresh and they need somebody else to affirm, to confirm, to endorse. Yeah, I believe that's God. I, uh, I just finished my Life of Abraham Zoom Bible study last Sunday. I'm driving up to my brother's yesterday. And the Lord said, uh, you know, impressions to my thought. My kid is with me. And, I, and he, I mean, he just downloaded, you need to keep this going and just, to, for now, just do it. A, a Zoom home fellowship meeting based on the model of what Paul did when he started his churches. Just invite people, whoever, totally free, totally spontaneous, or we're going to follow Corinthians 14, uh, when you assemble, each one comes with something. And so we're going to do it probably as early as next Sunday night. So I share it with my wife, and then uh, I said, you know, I think I can fill our living room <coughs> via Zoom. 
and, and uh, just free as whatever. So I called two other people, and the one brother I called, he wasn't answering, so I left a voicemail. Mark, he just lost his wife. His wife, I just did his wife's funeral uh, a week, uh, last Friday. And he's, he's in a wonderful place, by the way, and she was a jewel of a follower of Jesus. And she came through her own cancer of the throat and was on the other end of that, loving God, moving forward, and she ended up uh, getting a cold that turned into pneumonia, and she actually saw two angels come for her and told her husband, they have come, and I want to go. And it'll be two days from now, uh, they're going to take me. And that's exactly what happened. She had a real prophetic kind of thing. So she's in heaven rejoicing right now, and Mark asked me to do the funeral. Anyway, I, I just shared about the home Zoom fellowship meeting. And uh, he said, God spoke to me the exact same thing, Chuck. Three o'clock, so when I heard your voicemail, I got so excited. Bam! That's kind of an Elizabeth to me, you see? So we'll just do it. See what happens. Now what happens is, Elizabeth so blesses Mary, so affirms Mary, out of that 16-year-old heart comes what we call the Magnificat. Have you ever realized how stunning that set of verses is? How profound? How articulate my soul exalts the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. She knew she needed to be saved. For he has regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And on it goes, all the way down to verse 55. Wow, it's stunning. See, when you really affirm somebody and confirm somebody that they're hearing God, they're kind of conceived with a fresh something from the Lord, it releases in them faith and hope and declaration and confession. Mary stayed with her about three months. You would too. Are you kidding me? I think I'll hang out with my cousin Elizabeth. It's so refreshing. The house is so filled with peace and encouragement. But then it says, and then she returned to her home. And where she lives, there's someone waiting. Now you gotta understand, Joseph's a good man. He's probably six, seven, maybe eight years older than Mary. He's already got a business. He's a hard worker. He's following his way of system of the time. He's a good man. He's, he loves Mary. Mary loves Joseph. They wanna get married. All the plans are established. And now Joseph's life's about to be interrupted. And his plan's interrupted. He didn't maybe know exactly where Mary went. I don't know if he heard, but it's three months. But here's what I know. Now, at three months, some of you mamas, you can maybe help me. I guess at three months, you begin to show. Eventually, it's going to begin to show. And so she goes to be with Joseph. And now you got to go back to Matthew and pick up the store back there again. Mary, where have you been? Been worried about you. Sit down, Joseph, please. Her eyes probably begin to fill with tears. I have to tell you something. Really? 
Joseph's heart begins to pound. He gets a little bit nervous. What's she going to do? Call her off? What's she going to do? And then maybe he glances at her physical condition and he can't even go there. He can't even imagine what, you know, his fear maybe begins to grip his heart. Sit down, Joseph. Yes, I am brave. He's, his heart sinks. He's crestfallen. He, he may be, if he's not crying his guts out, he's probably been on the verge of getting angry. Joseph, it's not like what you think. It's nobody else. I had an encounter. He has to tell the story. Right? He doesn't believe her. He makes plan because he's a good man to divorce her. He's exercising his right, according to Moses' declaration, he's going to put her away. He doesn't believe her. Heaven looks down and says, I think we better intervene here and keep this interruption plan in the works. This is really important. And so while he's asleep, he gets, you know, a famous dream. Joseph, she's not lying. And so you have to be open when we sometimes wrestle and we sometimes struggle, even as we listen to somebody else bring whatever they're bringing, and trust, and it's so beautiful, God puts him to sleep and gives him a word, gets him out of soul into spirit. He totally embraces then Mary. You can imagine their reunion as they fall into each other's arms, weeping their guts out, but she's there, and he's there, and they're together, embracing the vision of God. And Jesus is born. We know the story. Uh, back, back in Luke chapter 2, you don't have to turn there. But the first people outside of Joseph and Mary and Elizabeth and Zacharias, who hears about the birth of God? Shepherds. Shepherds. See the importance of that? The shepherds are acknowledging the great shepherd has come. Just what David was talking about this morning. And they're blown away. Wow. And angels, by the way, angels don't sing. They declare. Angels are always saying something. Uh, as far as scripture, I don't know. Maybe eventually we'll all be singing and when we get to heaven. Who knows? But uh, they're worshiping God for sure. Okay, they do it nonstop, some of them. That's their job description. But they declare, we won't look at that. And shepherds go back to their flock. Wow, that's amazing. And then Jesus is born in a manger. Always in a manger. Humility. I could take you right now, and I'm not going to take the time of wonderful revivals that have spontaneously been birthed in a manger. In a place, Azusa Street Revival, 1906. That was nothing, that was, that was in the slums of LA. That was in a very, uh, what's the word, ghetto. Two, what happens now is two years later, and three wise men, which we know, come and bow down at the feet of Jesus, acknowledging. And there's Mary and Joseph looking at these three very powerful, wonderful, humble men who had already told Herod, who's troubled, a king has been born. And the wise men have three gifts that are super prophetic that they present. 
gold, this is God, frankincense, all kinds of life, and myrrh, suffering. Interruption. And the last interruption I'll just say is Simeon, who was there faithfully praying, mm -hmm. seeking God for years, maybe decades, and he had a promise from the Lord that he would not die until he saw the salvation of God. Mary comes in, Jesus is eight days old. How many little eight-day-old baby boys did Simeon see? We have no clue. Hundreds, maybe thousands. A lot of people there. How did he know there he is? Because he picks up Jesus in his arms, lifts him up, and says, Now, Lord, I can go home, for my eyes have seen the salvation. And then he gives a prophecy that's painful to Mary. He will be for the rise and fall of many, and a sword will pierce your own soul, which is Calvary. Hey, the birth of Jesus happens this way. We're in a year of interruptions. And the only thing I can say uh, is, Lord, I present my life to you in a fresh way in this awesome 2023. And Lord, you can interrupt my life. However you want to do it, here I am. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have Brother Micaiah, I love that name. Go get, your, go get all the kids downstairs. Um, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Zacharias, Elizabeth, Joseph, Mary, Simeon, Anna, <coughs> three wise men, shepherds, all interrupted with the birth of Christ. And you know God has been doing that for 2,000 years, interrupting his church, interrupting individual believers, interrupting to give birth to maybe a revival, to an outpouring of the Spirit. Come on, kids. Come on up here in front. Oh, boy, here we go. Where's, where's your buddy? Did he, is he up there? Come on up here. Uh, Annabelle? Annabelle. You know, when I get older, I... Children that you know, now refresh me. I said either you remember their names or you need a word of knowledge <laughs> for their name. So let's let's just show you one one more time because my word of knowledge right now is failing me. Young man, what's your name? I'm Garrett. Jared? Garrett. 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 My hearing aids are home. Can you tell? <laughs> Annabelle. Ariana, how do you, is that an A? Ariana? Ariel. Is that with an A? Ariel? Where did you get this? is Papa or Mama, this curly hair? Dad. Okay. That's your name. Elise. Aris? Elise. Elise. I'll say again. Elise. Elise. What a pretty name. Angie. Angie? Angie. Ainsley. Did I get it wrong yet still? Yeah. Spell it for you. Amen. You know, Jesus knows your names a whole lot better than I do. <laughs> and your names, I'm sure, have meaning to them. Because uh, I don't think mom and pop would pick names. Just, well, let's just name it that. Please help me out here now, Mom and Papa. You did seek God for their names. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Here, here's what I felt during worship. 
they're all at different ages, but you're representing something here. You're representing something. And I believe the Lord is saying to this group of young people that a, a wonderful mantle of evangelism mm -hmm. is going to come upon you. And you're going to lead young people kind of your age, wherever your place. Everybody's in school except all, all, so they're all in school. Of course, we know mama's in school. So everybody at, at your age group, and and just what I want you to do now. We've been talking about interruption when Jesus interrupts and your sister can, but you're going to get kind of like if you look at somebody in your classroom and you begin to almost have a desire, you might want to begin to cry a little bit. That's the birth of the Lord. That's going because that's the way God's going to, so, not soften, but lead you to different classmates who need Jesus, okay? And I really believe the Lord's saying, there's a mantle, church, extend your hands to this, young girl. There's a mantle, a strong mantle of evangelism that's going to come upon each one of you. And uh, just be sensitive to the Lord's uh, leading. And you're going to have maybe classmates come up to you almost spontaneously and start talking about their problems. And they have something that's hurting their heart. And you're going to tell them, well, Jesus can come into your life and change it totally and give you his peace and his love. Father, in the name of Jesus, I release a prophetic mantle of evangelism on each one of these young children. Lord, in the name of Jesus, from from the two boys, um, I know you're the oldest one. How old are you, son? 16. 15? 16. 16? Good. Great age. All the way down mm -hmm. to five or four. four. Father, in Jesus' name, just that shepherding heart that goes for the lost sheep. It's all set up. That's why the dad did the thing on finding the lost sheep. You have lost sheep in your classrooms. They really need Jesus. Okay? And so Father's going to do it. Lord, in Jesus' name, seal this. Lord, uh, be sensitive even. You might get interesting dreams in the night. And go to dad or mom and say, What's the interpretation of this dream? You've got, to, you've got to really interpret by the Spirit when you receive a dream in the Spirit. Just share it. Go for it. Uh, and the Lord wants to release His Word, His voice into each of your hearts. Father, in Jesus' name, it's time for harvest. Father, we're calling in the harvest in Baldwin. Start with young people. And young people will then bring mama and papa, at least some of them. That's gonna, it's going to be a, the Lord saying it's a youth movement. It's a, it's a youth movement. Go with it. This is what the Father is doing. Arise, sons and daughters. You're his sons. You're his daughters. The Lord saying, Arise. <coughs> Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. Uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, I should have stopped my recording. Oh, well. Kept it under 50 minutes. Way to go, Chuck. <laughs> David said, believe it or not, he did it. Thank, thank you, children. Hallelujah. Way to go. <coughs> David, I'll turn it back. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the life you speak into existence. You 
spoke John the Baptist into existence, you spoke Jesus into existence. And we thank you, Lord, for the lives you are calling into your kingdom that you spoke forth this morning. We just receive that faith. We just believe that you are going to do as you have said. And we just pray, Father, that you be preparing us. in the back. The Lord has put on your heart to bless Chuck as well, who will receive an offering for him and pass that along to him. As he has blessed us, we would like to bless him as well. So that is in the back of the church. The Holy Spirit leads you accordingly. Well, may the Holy Spirit give you Absolutely. just great hope and anticipation that he will do as he has said. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Amen.